Hi, Jennifer Stewart here. I'm so glad to have with me today Diane Maroney as part of my I Shine Bright series. Diane has been doing so many amazing things with kids, and I absolutely love her project, the Imagine Project, where she's helping kids be able to overcome anything that's kind of happened in their past and be able to take challenging situations and turn them into finding a positive. So how are you doing today, Diane? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am doing very well. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so glad to have you. And I wanted to give a little bit of a background. Diane has a long history, so I won't tell you guys everything she's done. It's amazing. But she is a clinical nurse specialist in psychiatric mental health nursing. And she's the founder, like I said, of the Imagine Project, which is a nonprofit organization that helps kids, teens, and adults overcome challenging life circumstances through expressive writing. I love that. I mean, journaling for anybody is amazing. So helping to overcome challenges through that is such a great idea. So she's a thought leader in the area of stress and trauma in children. Her simple yet profound seven-step writing tool, now used by schools across the U.S., gives kids and teens the opportunity to rewrite a challenging personal story and imagine new possibilities in its place. And I, I love that because we could focus on the bad things that happen, or we can think about where do we want to go? Where do, what do we want our future to like to look like? Very important part of the steps. Very important is to imagine what you want instead. Yeah, no, I love that. And she, she's written many books, so I won't read them all. There's, there's too many of them. But her most recent book is The Imagine Project, Empowering Kids to Rise Above Drama, Trauma, and Stress. And that one was published in 2018, and it won first place in the SIPA Eve Awards in the Parenting Division. So that's, that's amazing, Diane. And amongst many other books you guys can find, I'm sure, on Amazon or wherever you like to shop. So anyway, I wanted to chat with Diane today because I think her movement is so important for people to know about that you can take a challenging situation in life and turn it in, around and make it positive. We can grow from it. So I'm, I'm so excited. And I think it's something that I think not only can benefit kids, but adults too, as they learn about it. And yeah, I think I saw on your website, you have journals for children and adults. So we can touch, we can touch upon that today. But I always like to ask before we really get into discussing what you're doing now, what in the world got you started on this? Well, um, so it all really started with my childhood because I went through a lot as a child. I had a lot of trauma, a lot of stress. Um, I had an alcoholic, abusive father. I had um, some bad boyfriends. I was part of a gang. I know I don't look like it at all. But Not anymore. Well, different, uh, different kind of gang than the gangs of today. You know, no guns or knives. But um, and the, the worst part is that I. Um, I found my mom after she committed suicide. So that was extremely traumatic, along with the other issues. So, you know, it took me many, many years to figure out that I didn't have to be defined by those stories. I, you know, they taught me that I wasn't good enough, that people were going to desert me, you know, lots of negative things about myself. That took me years and years to process and hear and heal from. So, um, that's really where it started. And then my daughter, uh, I was a preemie nurse. I worked with preemies and with neonatal infant care. And then my daughter was born um, four months early, weighing one pound, 12 ounces. She was oh, my crazy. goodness. I know, size of a Pepsi can. And she's 25 now and doing yeah. amazing. So take a deep breath. But um, so after she was born, I, I really saw the trauma of prematurity. I saw how difficult it is for the baby and for the family. And so I went back to school and got my master's in psychiatric mental health nursing because I'm a nurse first. And um, we really started to learn about trauma in kids. And I used, so when I would speak about trauma in preemies um, to nurses and doctors and parents, I knew that if I told them my story, well, they would just think it was because I was a NICU nurse that I had this trauma, right? 
So I, this was in the early part of the internet. I asked other parents to tell me their story using the word imagine and to begin every sentence. And it was really powerful. You know, we would uh, listen to each other, read each other's stories on the internet and we would cry and there would be healing. And, and so in 2010, I just saw that the world really needed some inspiration. So I decided to write a book uh, about ordinary people with extraordinary stories. So I began traveling across the country, interviewing ordinary people with extraordinary stories. They had overcome, you know, intense. Um, one of the stories that I love to tell is about a, girl, a woman named Karina Sanchez. And she grew up in a very violent home. And she lost her mom when she was 14 from alcoholism. She lost her dad when she was young, pretty young. And then she moved around from house to house, and it was from friends and family, and it was really challenging and not safe. So she decided in her senior year of high school to try her luck living on the street. And she um, knew her education was her way out, so she would study really hard all day at school. And then she would leave the school and walk to the public library, which is about a mile and a half. And this was in Colorado in the dead of winter. And then she would study there until it closed, and she would walk back to the high school and take the cardboard out of one dumpster, put down the garbage of the other, and sleep there all night long. Oh. Sleep in the school the next morning when she heard the janitors, take a shower and start her day all over again. And the school never knew what it did before she graduated. When she turned 18, and she graduated top 10 in her class, she got a full ride scholarship to the University of Denver, which is a private college, beautiful old college and uh, graduated there in four years. And now she runs her own small business, she owns her own home, and she has two beautiful children. Oh, um, that's amazing. An incredible story. And so this, I created a, this book, which you can see on my website, theimagineimagine.org, and it was amazing. It's a coffee table photography book, really beautiful. But, um, and I just learned so much from these people. And, Probably one of the most common questions I get asked is, how did you find the people for these books? Because it appeared sure. the first thought, you're like, are there really this many people out there? And honestly, everybody has a story. Mm -hmm. And what was hard is to pick who got in the book and who didn't. So everybody, I, I mean, I would just start talking to people at parties or auditions and find random people. And they'd say, you should meet my uncle or you should meet my sister, you know, and or my story. And it's just amazing. That is so totally then, amazing. Yeah, and in in 2000, that was published in 13, 2013. And then after the book was published, I thought, well, what can I do with this? So I, it's a really important process. So I asked a friend who was Brian Sebler, kid Brian Sebler, can you see if your kids can put them on the story? And he did, and they did. And out of 28 kids, there were stories of bullying or of somebody sick in their family or of feeling left out or, you know, some small, smaller stories and some huge stories. But what really concerned me is that out of 28 kids, three of those kids talked about suicide. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, my, this is the window into their psyche. So I thought, okay, mail it. I need to keep going, you know, I need to keep doing this. So we, I created this seven step process and I've been going all over the country and it's now in 45 states and 10 countries and created four journals and it's just touching, you know, it's just allowing kids to be free and heal from it, you know, not carry it around for 40 years and then uh, until they can finally figure out how to live. Yeah. So, no, I, I love that. I love that, that you began by just talking with people and you saw how therapeutic the process was for them to work through that and, and share that with you. So that, that's amazing. Yeah, no, and I think and so many people around us have these incredible stories, but we often don't share them because we're not sure how other people are going to view us, right, if we share about our history. But in the end, I mean, as, as you learned, obviously sharing with each other, then we can bond and we can open up and we can heal. So that's, that's beautiful. Maybe that's what happens in the classroom or with, in, a, in a home, you know. If a child writes his, his or her imagined story in a classroom and then they bring it home to their parents, 
the parents say, wow, I, I mean, it's very powerful to hear your child's imagined story because they have things going on in their head that you don't even know is in there. You might suspect something's in there, but it's, it's amazing. And it really opens up a dialogue between parent and child or teacher and child or peers. It creates a camaraderie and a love sharing that's very yeah, well, so since you're already mentioning it, I think we should touch upon what what is the imagined story? What what what, what are you talking about? Because I think our listeners might not know what that is. Right. Well, the Imagine Project is a it's an expressive writing activity. So the seven step process and all in journal format because we like to be kind of led through things. So I created that. Um, it's all free, so you can download the journals for free at theimagineproject.org. And so it's seven steps. The first step is um, what's great about your life? What are you proud of? What do you love? What do you want to celebrate? And then the little ones can draw pictures if they want to. Um, and then the second step is what's been hard, whether it's reflect on something difficult, whether it was yesterday, five years ago, five weeks ago. Um, and then you take in step three, you take something that's been hard and you write an imagined story about it. So every sentence begins with imagine. You know, it might be imagine, um, imagine living in a house that you love. Imagine your parents coming home from work after you leave. Imagine leaving your friends. Imagine feeling like you're never going to have any more friends. Imagine making new friends. Imagine everything's okay. So the third step is more about the difficult step, the difficult part of it. And trust me, every child has something to say. Every, every child has a story. And then um, the fourth step is you ask them, okay, this has been hard. What do you want instead? Um, what do you want out of that story? How do you want that to change? You know, I want a house that I love. I want it to be as fun I want as, a, as the old house was. I want it to be friends. You know, imagine having as many friends as I had at the old house or at my old school. And then step five is transforming imagined dreams into I statements, I am, I can, I will. I am smart enough to get grades. I can get good grades, I will graduate. Um, and then step six is, what do you have to do to make your dreams happen? Because it's important to teach them, it's not just them, not just anybody else, but it's their job to work towards their dreams. And then step seven is uh, a challenge, a 30 day challenge for write down three things that you want to imagine in your life, three things that you're grateful so after step three, and if you're in a school format or even at home, you ask um, kids to share if they want to, only if they want to. And it's important to tell them, you write this and you, I don't have to see it. It's, it's your, for your eyes only unless you want to share it with me. And then probably in a parent-child situation, your kids will share. Maybe not right away, but they might want to share it with you. Especially if you write your story as a parent and share it with your child, then they'll be more likely to share it. I love that, for sure. It's really a huge dynamic in a family. It's very important. And then, so initially I thought, you know, that it might create bullying to hear the kids' stories. But it's actually the opposite of that. It creates camaraderie and the kids, kids rally. You know, they do, they see somebody going through something and they hug them and they just, they, there was a little boy that, um, read a story about how he just, a fifth grader that had just come to this new school, and he lost his dad when he was young. He'd moved six times in the last ten years. He was feeling sad because he was trying to make it through life, and he, you know, it was hard for him. And when the kids didn't, they didn't know that. And when they found out, they were like, "Come play with me," you know. And it didn't just last for a week; it lasted for the entire year. Yeah. So that changes. That makes them feel okay about their story if they have. A yeah, no, I love that because I think a lot of times bullying will stem from kids who are upset about their home life or their history or whatever. And so they're, they're lashing out. But when then when they realize that other kids are just like them and they have challenges or, you know, things in their past they don't love, then they're going to bond together and they're going to want hopefully lift each other up as opposed to putting each other down. So, yeah, no, that's amazing. They're so resilient. They really are. I mean, if you could, you can't imagine the stories that I hear. And even from a classroom that you think that they're all going to be just about losing 
puppy dogs or something else, you know. Just last week, I was in a classroom with third and fourth graders. They had the whole school was being led by the fifth grade. That one child was talking about how it was hard to go in the basement when he was afraid and that he would run up the stairs, which we all remember doing when we were kids. And then um, the other, he picked a girl to read, and she talked about her parents fighting and that um, that child protective services had come to her house as a result of spiritual things had taken away from her parents. So it just ranges from, you can't, you just don't know. And what's really important is they get a chance to see. Because there's just something, something about the word imagine that makes it safer. And yeah. more healing. I don't know exactly why, if it engages more with the right side of the brain or, you know, it's just, it helps. It makes it safer and the kids really like the word imagine. So it's yeah, well, I, I think, I mean, that can be true for adults, too. I mean, because we can focus on the bad parts of our life, or we can choose to focus on where we want to go and what that can look like. And oftentimes, if we spend a lot of time focusing on that, I mean, they, they, they often say, you know, you, you get what you think about, you know. <laughs> so if we spend a lot of time thinking about where we want to go, then, then our, I think our brain starts to help us create those plans and create those action steps to get there. And, you know, it's really interesting because it's very heavy when the kids all read their, their difficult stories. I mean, but it's heavy. And, but it's really important, even especially when an adult does it, to push yourself to keep going. You know, when you do it with teachers, they'll say, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. Because it gets hard when you start talking about the hard stuff. And then, but if you say you have to get to step four, you have to, and then you're like, oh, I can breathe again. You know, oh, yeah, I can think about that instead of that. You know, and they design their story, and kids love that. You know, they'll write, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a singer, I want to be, you know, it, they love it. So it's really important to teach them that they can overcome the stressors and the trauma of life because statistics show that stressors are is escalating and yeah. trauma is really present you know, 50 to 100 percent of kids are, have a tra traumatic event before the age of 17. sure so it's depending upon their environment but just white middle class well educated is 50 percent so yeah add in stuff and it gets it's higher so it's yeah no definitely i mean yeah, kids not only have the same stressors that we had growing up, but now we have all of technology and all of social media, and that creates all this like whole new world of stress on them. So they have compounded upon what we had as kids. So if we're going to compound their stress, we need to compound their tools. We need to give them more tools to help them cope, which is not really happening. Yeah. And just to see if they can cope with it the way we did, then we have to learn you know, techniques to help them, teach them how to really cope with it. Definitely, yeah. It's, it's not good for the soul. It's not good for the body. <laughs> it's not good for the mind. It's <laughs> yeah, well, well, I'm pretty sure that um, they say stress is one of the leading causes for disease in general. So, yeah, think about that. If we begin having that as a child, what that's going to look like as an adult. Yeah. Yeah, it's worse for a child because we're developing brain pathways, you know, neural pathways as a child. And if those are all stress related, that's how they grow up thinking the world works, you know. And right. that, so it's really important to mitigate as early as possible. And the youngest Imagine Project journal is, you know, you could even use it for preschool if the kids can write or draw. Because it goes along, it's not until about second grade you can actually write an imagined story. You know, the sentence begins with this, what it happens. Sometimes first graders are more advanced. But, um, so I wrote a children's book called Byron the Caterpillar Who Loved to Imagine. And then the journal kind of follows that children's book of, you know, um, asking them questions about have they ever been angry or sad? And what do you do when you're angry? And what are some things you can do? What does Byron do? you do and then about happiness and courage and lots of things so and all the all the journals and the children's books are all available in spanish too so just 
Yeah, no, I, I love that. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you, because I'm sure you see all these different types of kids, are what are some of the warning signs that parents and teachers and other coaches or whatever involved with kids can look for in kids that might be coming, you know, super stressed out? What are some of the, the beginning signs so we can get a hold of them and hopefully help them before it gets too late? <laughs> well, I think you can look at physical or emotional changes. You know, physical changes might be more uh, some stomach aches, some headaches, sick more often, um, acne. Uh, you can, they can eat more, eat less. You know, they're changing their eating patterns. Uh, sleep more, sleep less. And then they might become more clingy. They might regress in some of their behaviors like thumb sucking or needing a blankie or what, um, something, you know, some behavioral stuff. They get more aggressive. They act out. They don't want to go to school. Um, you know, those, some of those kinds of things are early signs. So they're too stressed. Yeah, no, for sure. That sounds like some great advice for parents to help them be able to just watch for those beginning warning signs, right? I mean, I think sometimes we're so busy in our own lives and busy trying to get them to this practice and that practice, and we, we're missing um, watching for some of those things that are going on, right? I mean, and, and for kids, I mean, social issues and things are such a big deal for them. So to us, my baby, it's silly. You know, we're thinking silly that they got in a fight with their best friend. But to that child, it can be the world, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Yes. being able to be in tune with that and yeah. it's my dream that a child will learn that if they're upset about something they can go write an imagined story about it kind of let it go show it to you if you want to or not and let it go and then move on and you know not let it fester and create that stress so then they can go have fun and play and do what kids yeah. do best no, I like that. So, so I guess I didn't think about that necessarily. So you teach them the process and then you're hoping when something else comes up that is stressful for them that they can go back and repeat that again. Is that kind of the idea? And teachers who have done in the classroom um, will do that. You know, if they say, if a child, a student is acting funny, you know, feeling, feeling left out or sad, then they could say, you know, why don't you go write an imagined story about that? they will and they show it to them and they I've had a teacher say well why don't you show that to your mom and it changes everything you know because then the parents become aware of because we just think they're going about their day just like we are you know but sometimes they're not they're festering this you know thought about something that's been really bothering them and they don't know what to do with it and they don't know how to talk about it so if you encourage them to talk about it then it's a habit of that so and then it moves up into adulthood yeah, no, I, I love that. So aside from the journal, um, then what are some of the things that parents and adults can do to kind of get kids to open up? What are some maybe beginning ways to have a conversation or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think listening, first of all. You know, we, we might listen on the news. <laughs> and, you know, we might say, okay, go get your shoes. What was it you were trying to tell me today? But that doesn't work. You know, it really doesn't. We have to really be mindful when we listen. I wish I, I wish I would have known this when I was raising my kids. Here, but because um, I really, I, I could have practiced this more. But you know, do something with them. Color, create. You know, make cookies or do something mindful where you, you know, taste the food that you're eating together and say, mm, "What does this taste like?" And and then just say, "So, you know, tell me about your day." Or have a conversation using um, how, what, and tell. How was your day? How was that when so-and-so said that to you? What was that like? And don't guide their conversation, but listen. So that's like one of the primary keys is listening. And then, you know, make sure you give them downtime, of course, which we struggle with because we don't even have our own downtime. Um, and I'm big on meditation. I'm big on nature. Uh, I'm from Colorado, so we're big on that here, but I know not everybody has access to that. But, you know, finding time in a day, at least an hour, where you're engaged with your child. Give them an opportunity to talk about their day and to relax, because we don't give them enough time to relax. And 
it's in a parasympathetic mode. Okay, there's sympathetic where you're rushing, 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 running, and then there's a parasympathetic mode where we're healing and relaxing. Parasympath your body needs to go into parasympathetic as many times a day as you can. Mindfulness does that. Meditation does that. You've probably heard this before, but for those who don't, you know, so it's important to give kids the opportunity to, for their bodies to learn that relaxation. Because remember, their pathways are forming. They're neural pathways. And if you don't teach them that, their bodies are really going to struggle to do that when they're adults. So we have to teach them that as children because that's where healing happens. That's where the body becomes healthy. So fewer opportunities for relaxation is fewer opportunities for health. So if you can add that up. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that. And I, I think so many times that in our modern world, we think of relaxing as sitting down and just watching a movie or staring at a video game or, but those are not ways that our brain can just be completely quiet. Like you said, getting out in nature, maybe just go for a walk down the block. It doesn't have to be this like big, huge planned out event. It can no. just be walk to the end of the street and back. And that has some time for chatting. Um, or like you said, cooking together, making brownies or cookies. I mean, what kid doesn't like that? So that's already like a fun activity. Yeah, and I know for myself, yeah, I mean, I love um, when the kids are going to bed, laying down next to them. That seems to be, in our family, one of the best times when they will just share what happened, like whether it's good or bad or whatever in their day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and reading, you know, sharing, talking about a story, uh, you know, whatever feels comfortable. I mean, you don't have to get out of your comfort zone, but you got to find something that's going to be comfortable in their comfort but downtime is huge. You have, almost have to find it these days. It's just too bad. Yeah. I know, no, for real, because I think so many parents are, are competing against who's the busiest, right? It's like, it's like there's some kind of trophy for who's busiest. It's like, no, I, there needs to be a trophy for who spends the most quality, relaxing, quiet time together. <laughs> it's self-care. I mean, that's self-care. And we, it's been lost in our world, and it needs yes. to come back. But we need to teach them. And the Imagine Project is self-care. And all those things apply to self-care. You know, so mm -hmm. it's important that we teach them. Yeah, no, I love that. And do you think your, your project can work just as well for parents at home as it does in a school? I know you originally kind of designed it for schools. but Well, I really just designed it for someone to do it on their own, a child or a uh, parent, but I couldn't, it's harder to get kids to do it unless they have a teacher that's saying, please do this, or a parent that's saying, no, I want you to do this. So it's, it's designed for either, really, but I reach more kids in a classroom, so, you know, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. desirable to meet, reach as many kids as possible. So it's very, it's excellent for teaching at home. So um, having a whole family do it together, um, or just have kids, you know, just, but it's really important for the parent to do it too. I mean, sure. you'll see, if you do this yourself, wow, this is bigger and better than I thought it was. So, yeah. It's important for everybody. No, well, that's beautiful because I think as parents, as parents heal, heal themselves, they can help their children better. And also, then there's the additional benefit of modeling for kids because they're often going to do what we do and not what we say <laughs> to do, right? So, yeah. We always say if there's something going on with your child, you better check yourself first. Because yes. if I healed myself, then my kids shifted. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, when you're struggling with something with your child, go write your own imagined story about it. And you can always show it to them. It's huge. They'll never know that you felt that way. If, if needed, if you need to show it to them. So it's, I really encourage everybody of all ages to do it. Yeah, no, that, that, that's beautiful. I mean, I, I think our kids can recognize our energy and our emotions much more than we, than we want to believe or want to think. So they're, they're definitely in tune to that. Yeah, we need to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of our kids, for sure. Right. And what are some ways if someone who's listening to this would love to introduce this to their school? Do you have any suggestions about how they could go about that? Well, on the website, The Imagine Project, just, you just have to remember to put the in front of it, theimagineproject.org. 
Um, there's a bunch of videos, and there are kids and te you know, the teacher talking about it, me talking about it. So I would say go watch those videos. Say I really love this uh, project. You can they can buy my latest book, The Imagine Project: Empowering Kids to Rise from Trauma, Trauma, and Stress. There's a link on the website to both find it on the website and on the Amazon. Um, and buy it for them. You know, it's not expensive and really, and then buy it for the teacher if you really want to, but if you can't do that, just tell them about it. And talk to journal and say, did you see this? This is really cool. And, you know, there's lesson plans on the website. They can print off for their teachers for all ages. So I would, I would love it if parents would reach out to teachers. A lot of teachers don't know about it. Sure. And when they, they love it, you know, and we're doing research. It's based evidence-based practice. So there's a lot of teachers want to create as evidence-based things. So the research shows that it increases GPA, grade point average. It decreases dropout rates. It helps with anxiety and depression. It does a lot of things. So it's good stuff, and it's free. So you know, can't be. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I I, I love it. I I saw that you have journals for all these different ages, and I think it's beautiful. I mean, it's something that I think that more and more people, if they can understand that we can take challenges and turn them around and, and focus on where, where we want to go, that it would make such an impact in the world. So I love what you're doing. And so is, is that the best way for people to learn more about um, what you're doing is to go to your website and look at the journals and watch the videos? Is that what you recommend? I think so. And if they feel so, um, you know, so driven to, they can buy the book. Uh, the latest book is, and the children's book, you know, for the little ones, and it's cute. Even adults like the story of the children's books. Um, you know, if that fits, if not, it's not necessary, but um, it can be part of it. Uh, it. The book is written for parents and teachers. Both. So yeah, theimagineproject.org, and I do have a Facebook page and Instagram, um, which you can find on the website, too, if you want that. Sign up for the newsletter. So we're having a big fundraiser, but that's in Denver. So <laughs> if you're out of state, sorry, but we are having a very fun fundraiser in April. So. All right. Well, somebody out there might be listening to you from uh, from Denver, so you never know. <laughs> So amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I, I absolutely love what you're doing and I'm happy to help promote it. And I hope more people will share it and learn about it and help create a difference in the world and help, you know, grab these kids who are feeling stressed out or anxious. And if we can get them when they're young and help teach them those skills about how to deal with life, then how amazing will that be when they're older and really, really big stuff as an adult comes on? I mean, at some point, we have to learn how to deal with it because life, unfortunately, is not always roses for us. It's not always perfect. So yeah, we have to teach our kids that you know we can create what we want in our life and to be positive and grateful and imagine. So yeah. thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm so glad to have you. All right. Make sure you guys go check out the imagineproject.org where she has so many amazing resources for you. And I just, I, it's a great website. So you're going to want to see it on there. All right. Thank you, Diane.